Hey everybody, welcome to today's Patreon only bonus episode. Today's case is still kind of an ongoing one and it's a bit different from our usual cases, but I thought that it was an important one to talk about given that it's been almost 11 years with no answers and the family remains desperate for these answers. So we're gonna get right into it guys. You already know who I am. I'm your true crime bestie, Annie, here to break down another true crime case for you bonus edition. Not Taylor's version, Annie's version. Bonus version. So guys, let's get into it. Six-year-old Emma Philippoff was born on January 6, 1986, in Perth, which is a small town in Ontario. She lived with her parents, James and Shelley, and she had three siblings, who she was very close with. The family lived in a home that they actually built themselves, and they lived in a very tight-knit and close community, where everybody really just kind of looked out for each other. It was very much the stereotypical wholesome childhood and family vibes. She had what seemed to be a very good and happy childhood, too. Her parents, however, did end up getting divorced, and some people do say that that had an impact on her. But other than that, everything was very normal and also very quiet in their household. Growing up and into her adulthood, Emma definitely gave off these just kind of like very chill, very hippie type vibes. She took after her father's more creative and artistic side, and she loved photography, loved the arts, loved cooking, just everything to where she could really explore and get creative. She was also extremely free-spirited and kind of just marched to the beat of her own drum. She loved to travel and also just really wanted to see the world. She was definitely that friend that you would go to if you wanted to do something a little bit more fun and spontaneous because you knew that she would always be down for a good time. She was also an extremely kind and caring person, and she was always seen hanging out with crowds other people tended to kind of shy away from, including many people who were homeless. She just had a big heart. She was around everyone. She found the good in everyone. She also had a very big soft spot for the elderly, for children, and for animals. Once she was a bit older, she often hung out with street performers and artists that would be traveling in her town because she didn't really look at these people as strangers, especially when they portrayed the same qualities and personalities that she did, and they just kind of lived a life that was normal to them, although different from normal societal expectations or standards. She was described as being one of those people who just loved to laugh and who you could always go to and would always be an open ear and listening ear, but rarely ever talked about her own struggles or even her own personal life. And the side that most people got from her was the smiling, happy, and laughing Emma. She wasn't huge on dating and was only known to have one relationship, which lasted about three months before it ultimately fizzled out. After graduating high school, she studied photojournalism in Ontario and then went on to study culinary arts at North Island College. And that's when she began working as a chef, and she enjoyed this. But she didn't exactly love Campbell River, which was the city that her college was located in. In the fall of 2011, Emma decided that she wanted to start somewhere new, start over. So she moved to Victoria. During the time that she lived in Victoria, she definitely lived a more unstable lifestyle, living in multiple different places with different jobs that she didn't even end up keeping very long. When she first moved, she stayed with a childhood friend and their partner for a few months before then moving into a unit by herself in that same complex. She had gotten a job as a barista in a cafe and just a few months into living in Victoria, but she didn't really stick with the job for very long. Now, since she didn't have a very stable income at times, she very quickly moved out of the apartments and then she began hopping from place to place. At one point, she had stayed with another friend for a few months at the place where her friend lived in Hotel 760, where she had worked as a housekeeper for a short period of time. She had even at times slept in the woods, sometimes in a tree, and was said to even have slept in a few different boats from time to time. Then, from February to November 2012, she had been staying in the attic of a women's shelter on a more rotating basis, usually for a month at a time. 
During this time, she also got a seasonal chef job at a popular local restaurant called Redfish Bluefish, and she was scheduled to work until October 31st and then was expected back in February of 2013. You see, Redfish Bluefish was a popular tourist destination on the harbor. So their times were a little bit weird, but Emma loved it because she got to talk to new and interesting people every day while being outdoors on the water and not locked away in an office from 9 to 5, which she absolutely loved. During the time that she lived in Victoria, she remained in contact with her family, but definitely on a very casual and irregular basis. She didn't believe in cell phones, so she would occasionally write emails to her family whenever she was visiting the library, and she would sometimes call from payphones on holidays. Since she didn't really speak to her family on a regular basis, they actually had no idea that she had been living at a woman's shelter for the majority of the year. With her paychecks from Redfish Bluefish, Emma was finally able to save up enough money and purchase a 1993 Mazda MVP van. The van had a lot of work that needed to be done, but Emma was willing to take on this challenge. She wanted to fix it up and to be able to live and travel in the van, living that van life lifestyle. At the time that she purchased the van in the summer of 2012, it was in such rough shape that it actually had to be towed from place to place instead of driven. But I guess you could say it was the most stable living condition that she had experienced in a while. She packed all of her belongings into the van, and she lived out of it in between her stays at the woman's shelter. She told people that she looked forward to being able to drive the van home to Perth to finally see her family. So in the summer of 2012, it was definitely one of the most critical times of personal growth for Emma. She had bought the van, she was working on it for her plans for the future, and began living a much more clean and healthy lifestyle than she had ever lived before. Before, Emma was known to have loved having a drink or two with friends, but she had decided to completely cut drinking out of the equation. She also cut out cigarettes, sugar, and coffee completely out of her diet. Now, there's a little bit of a mixed review on if at times she did smoke weed, and some people say that she did on occasion, and others said that she never did any kind of drugs. She also had become a vegan and was experimenting with new kinds of foods and dishes that she had never eaten before. Toward the end of the summer, it seemed as if this new clean eating diet and lifestyle had kind of gotten a little out of hand, though, and she began showing some signs of possible eating struggles, which unfortunately does happen to many young women. What started off as a vegan diet and trying new food combinations turned into Emma just eating less and less and less, and then drinking high amounts of water in what seemed to be like an attempt to make herself feel more full without eating. So some of her friends began to notice that she had gotten extremely thin and described her eating habits as monk-like, where she would fast for long periods of time and then just not eat very much at all. In addition to her eating habits, her friends said that she clearly began to become more worried and stressed as the fall season was nearing an end, including stressing over her seasonal job, which wouldn't be back in season again until February. It was very clear that she was becoming more fearful of the future and what she was going to do. Even though she had the van, it wasn't at all ready and equipped to comfortably withstand the winter months. Not to mention she couldn't even drive it to warmer areas. It still had to be towed from place to place. The restaurant was also her only source of income, and the way that she paid for the van and all of its problems was through that money. So I can only imagine the stress that she was going through when she didn't have that stability and that consistency, that income. She slowly had become more withdrawn from her friends, which they kind of just chalked up to the stress of it all. But like we mentioned, Emma was an extremely private person. So it wasn't like her friends knew at all times what she was dealing with mentally. Most times, she wrote in her journal. But she did start showing some external warning signs of a possible mental crisis as early as 2011. In the winter of 2011, when Emma had been living with her childhood friend for a short period of time, her friend noticed that she would often do odd things, like obsessively arranging objects like feathers, rocks, shells, and food. And she also would insist that everyone did the same out of fear and worry. One night, her friend had woken up to Emma outside in the middle of the night in what she described as a euphoric state. Her friend had been so concerned for her that she actually contacted Emma's father, who had offered her a plane ride home, but she declined and said that she was fine and that she would continue to be fine on her own. 
Some of her friends claimed that she had ongoing stress due to a man that she had said had been harassing her ever since she had been studying the culinary arts back in 2008 and 2009. Apparently, she had a pretty bad experience with him that she would never really go into great detail about, but it was clear that it had been something that deeply affected her. She at times would express not wanting to be in social situations that involved men, and it was also the main reason that she had made sure she did not stay in co-ed shelters. She never specifically wrote in her journal what had happened to her either, but I think as a fellow woman, I can imagine a few possible situations. Nothing much had happened after that incident, at least in the presence of others, until the time leading up to the winter when she had become extremely stressed about her job coming to an end and what to do during those winter months. She was distant, closed off, and increasingly more paranoid. She had turned down invitations to hang out with friends and to go on adventures and even canceled a trip to Mexico with one of her friends at the very last minute, which was definitely not like Emma at all. She was always down for adventure and fun. So what was going on here? Staff and other residents at the shelter even began to notice a huge change in Emma. They too noticed how paranoid she had seemed to become. She had gone from the bubbly girl who never knew a stranger and always had a smile on her face to someone who kept to themselves and didn't make any extra stops to talk to people. And then in her room, she kept to herself. She kept the curtains in her room closed at all times and was often seen frantically moving her furniture out to the curb, claiming that they were making too much noise and speaking to her. She began donating and selling all of her personal belongings, including clothing and, and things that seemed like basic necessities or were things that she had loved at one point and had not once lived without. So the staff grew increasingly more worried about Emma. They knew that giving away possessions is a huge characteristic in people who are having thoughts about ending their life, and they were worried that she might have been having a mental health crisis. Legally, due to privacy laws and the fact that Emma was a 25-year-old grown adult, they weren't allowed to call her parents and inform them of their worries. So they did what they believed was the next best option, and they called the police to request a mental health check. Now, we know how often mental health gets ignored and pushed to the side, and unfortunately, it was no different in this case. The police told the staff that they would not be coming to do a mental health check on Emma and to call back if they noticed any more odd behaviors, as if the whole reason they called to begin with wasn't about the odd behaviors that she had already been having. Now, Emma's mother has been very open about the fact that she believes that the staff still should have called her, even without giving any details that would legally get them into trouble, because she believes that she deserved to have known sooner than she did about Emma's behavior. If I were you, based on my experience of Emma living here for on and off for nine months, if I was Emma's mom, I would be here. That's not divulging a lot. That's not, that's not annihilating privacy laws. That is just being a human being, trying to help another human being. A friend who was also staying in that same women's shelter saw how Emma had been acting, and she tried to be of some help. She convinced her to get a membership at the local YMCA so that she could get out of the shelter and be able to work out or just be somewhere other than that shelter at all times, especially if she was refusing to leave her room. It could be extremely isolating. She also encouraged her to go to local coffee shops and do things that she used to love doing, and also to reach out to her mother since it had been a while since they had caught up, and it clearly seemed like she needed somebody, someone she trusted, someone to talk to right now. Emma was seen on November 20th in YMCA footage entering and exiting the facility four times within a 14-minute period. In this footage, she appears to be looking out the windows at certain times, very nervously, like she is watching for someone, which would be very similar to her behavior in the following days. Starting on November 23, 2012, Emma had made a series of tearful and upsetting phone calls to her mom, Shelly. The calls were mostly Emma being homesick and very worried about the future and what she was going to do. Her mother consoled her and told her that she would make arrangements for her to come home and told her that everything was going to be okay and that they'd get it all sorted out. 
The next day, Emma called her mother back and told her that she would be staying in Victoria and that she would be figuring things out on her own. Now, this happened a total of four times, back and forth. Emma saying she wanted to come home, her mother saying she would get flights and living arrangements worked out for her, Emma turning it down saying she didn't want to do that anymore. Emma had told her mother that she didn't know how she could face her. It seemed like she maybe had a lot of guilt for possibly not being in contact with her family as much anymore or not having it all figured out and needing to ask for help. Shelly's mom instincts kicked in and she knew that no matter what Emma was saying, her daughter needed her. She needed her help or just someone to be there for her at the very least. So she scheduled to come to Victoria later in the week and told Emma they would figure out what to do from there, together. This all seemed to have caused even more stress for Emma, though. Friends and acquaintances said that they saw Emma at the harbor after that, clearly anxious and on edge about everything. When they asked what was wrong, she just said that she was very nervous for her mother to come into town. On November 28th, Emma called Shelley at 4.30 a.m. She simply told her mother, don't come, not tonight. Shelley noticed a very huge difference in Emma's voice and the way that she spoke. There was a history of mental illness in their family, and Shelley knew that based on how Emma was sounding, something was not right, and she was extremely worried by this. Emma's other family members tried to tell Shelley that everything was fine and that she should just let Emma have some space and some independence to figure things out on her own, but she couldn't help it. She had to get to her daughter and see firsthand how she was doing, so she canceled everything and she booked a flight to Victoria that was set to arrive that same afternoon. She didn't talk to Emma again throughout that day. When Emma had first called Shelley, the caller ID was from the woman's shelter, known as Sandy Merriman's. Because Emma kept things private from everyone, including their family, Shelley didn't think anything of it. She thought that Sandy Merriman might have been the name of a friend whose phone she was using to call. When she called the number back, though, she discovered that it was not a friend, but a shelter. And this is when she learned that Emma had been staying there on and off since the winter of 2011, almost an entire year. When Shelley got to the shelter after arriving in Victoria at around 11 p.m. that night, she was shocked to find out that Emma had not claimed her bed that night. She knew that something wasn't right, and she immediately called the police from the shelter so that she could file her as a missing person. Police arrived around 12 a.m. to take the report and officially filed her as a missing person. Police knew based on friends and staff members at the shelter that Emma had owned a van and that it was somewhere that she kept most of her belongings that she hadn't gotten rid of, so they began trying to track it down. Surely, if Emma had just decided to up and leave, she would have taken her van to travel in to live in, even if it wasn't still in driving condition. Emma had been keeping her van at Chateau Victoria, which was a hotel in Victoria, So when investigators arrived at the hotel, they were told by staff that they had put a ticket on the van a day ago, a day prior to be towed off of their property. Apparently, Emma had come in the day before frantic and very upset about the fact that it was going to be towed, and she asked them to just give her one more day to come and get it before towing it. And it seemed that they were feeling pretty empathetic that day because they agreed and told her that it was fine, she had one more day or it would be gone. That day was the 29th, the night after Shelley had arrived in Victoria and discovered that Emma was missing. By the time investigators arrived at the hotel, her van had already been towed to their lot, so police went to go and take a look. When they found the van, it looked like it had been completely untouched. Her belongings, such as her clothing, her passport, her laptop, journals, a camera, and even recently borrowed library books were all still inside. Even if she had decided to leave the van behind and travel somewhere, she probably would have taken her passport, or at least a change of clothes, right? So this is when police started to feel a bit more wary about the whole case. They had the van towed to their lot so that they could look into it further. Police started putting together a timeline to try and figure out where Emma had last been seen and if anyone else had seen or talked to her. So far, they knew that at 4.30 a.m. on the 28th, when Emma made that call to Shelly, telling her not to come anymore, and then she left the shelter shortly after that call. And then that was at 7 a.m. when she arrived at the hotel and found the notice on the van. Almost an hour and a half later, at 8.23 a.m., Emma is caught on surveillance cameras at the 7-Eleven store on the corner of Douglas and Humboldt Street, where she used her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid debit card. 
She was seen wearing a beige-colored winter jacket, camo pants, and her hair was in a bun. She was seen with several bags over her shoulder, including her orange purse. Police noticed in the videos that she didn't just leave right away. She lingered for a bit by the doors, nervously checking the windows. Could it have been because she was waiting on someone? Or was she nervous and afraid of someone that might have been following her? At 10 a.m. is when a man named Julian Heward comes into the picture. Julian had a brief friendship with Emma during the time that she had been living in Perth before moving to Victoria. He actually moved to Victoria a little bit after Emma did, but their friendship pretty much ended at that and they didn't stay in contact. Julian claimed that while he was on a bus in Victoria, he saw Emma on Pandora Avenue in front of Alex Goulden Hall, which is a performance hall in Victoria. He got off the bus and was facing Emma, waiting on her to turn his way so that he could kind of just like wave her down and start up a conversation. But he said she wouldn't turn around and face him, so he decided that he would continue with what he had been on the bus for and register his health card, and if she was still there when he was done, then he would try to talk with her again. When he came back, she was still there, motionless on the corner. He claimed that he stepped in front of her and was trying to peer into her hoodie that was hiding her face and asked if she needed any help. Emma allegedly gave him a blank stare and shook her head as if to say no. Since she wasn't really responding to him and wouldn't take his offer for help, he claimed that he decided to give up and leave. At one point, Julian ended up being named a person of interest in this case, and a more detailed backstory of their relationship was that Julian had actually met Emma a few years before she moved out of Perth. They had a good enough friendship where they would take long walks together and do some activities, which led Julian to start having some feelings for Emma. We know from earlier that Emma really never had been the relationship type, so she very quickly set the boundary that they would just be friends, and then shortly after that, she moved to Victoria. Julian claimed that it was a pure coincidence that he had found a job in Victoria, which is, by the way, 2,500 miles away from Perth, and says that it was a total coincidence that he had moved there not long after she did, but he did admit that he hoped he would run into her. Julian claimed that one day he had run into her and the two of them had a very quick chat. He said that Emma had seemed excited that they saw each other and allegedly said that she wanted to visit him one day when she got off work so that she could spend some time with him. But that had apparently been the last that he had seen her since that day in front of the performance hall. So all eyes had been on Julian, not only because of the fact that he had moved after she did and was possibly one of the last people to have seen Emma, but also because he had messaged her father something that a lot of people found to be very, very odd. This message was not something that James had seen before she disappeared, so seeing it after the fact made it even weirder. Apparently, he was going to a concert soon, and he wanted to invite Emma to go with him, but he didn't know how to get in contact with her since she had no social media or no cell phone. He messaged her father James to try to figure out where she was staying, and he wrote, The last thing I want to do is be stalking her like last time. Now, as odd as this message seemed, it was written off with the explanation that because he was a Frenchman from Quebec who was not very fluent in English, he didn't quite understand the correct use of the word stalking. This message caused police to look at Julian as a person of interest and a suspect for a pretty long time. He was questioned by police, passed a polygraph, and even did interviews in an attempt to share her story. So now that we've gone over that huge part of the timeline and who Julian is, let's move on to the rest of the day, on to the 28th, sometime between when Julian saw Emma at 10 and before 1 p.m. when Emma was seen by Redfish Bluefish colleagues still on Pandora Avenue, right near a soup kitchen. When the man tried talking to Emma, she said that she didn't feel well and couldn't talk. He offered to give her a hug and stated that she had been visibly shook and horrified by this offer and that she immediately retreated. At around 1 p.m., a witness claimed to have seen Emma still on Pandora Avenue with a very vacant look in her eyes and claimed that she was just slowly shuffling along the side of the street. After realizing the next day that she had been the missing girl from the news, the witness called the police and gave them a full report. Sometime between 1 and 4 p.m., four more witnesses saw Emma at different times and places. Two witnesses claimed they saw her on Douglas Street sometime in the afternoon. 
They noted that she seemed extremely lost and confused and was just slowly pacing back and forth on the street. They were extremely concerned by the way that she was acting and had called 911 that day to report it. While we do know that the police took that report over the phone, it's unclear if the police ever followed up on that report. The third witness claimed to have seen Emma walking downtown with an older man. No description was ever given of the older man that they had seen, though. The fourth and final witness from those hours came from a man who said that he had seen Emma there when he had visited the Rocky Bay Shelter. This was a particularly odd claim because the shelter was co-ed and it was one that Emma had refused to stay in ever or even go into. Between 4 to 6 p.m., Emma was seen by the same witness two different times in two different locations. They first saw her when she crossed their paths as they exited the main Douglas doors of the Bay Center. She was still seen shuffling, walking slowly toward the west side of the building. They said that the most notable thing about her was her long, blonde, flowing hair that was blowing in the wind outside of her jacket. About 45 minutes after this, while they were in the car, Emma passed in front of them again. They made eye contact and claimed that Emma gave them a very sad and hopeless smile, so different from the usual smile that you would give random people on the street just as a gesture to not look rude. They too knew when they saw her picture on the news as a missing person who that was and who they had seen, so they called the police on the 30th to report what they had witnessed. Police took their contact information but never called back to get a full report. At 5.54 p.m., Emma was seen back at the same 7-Eleven where she had purchased the prepaid card. She used her debit card to buy a prepaid cell phone, which we know was something extremely out of the blue for Emma. She was seen the same as earlier, lingering by the doors looking outside as if she was nervous and checking if it was okay to leave. At 6 p.m., Emma had arrived at the Sandy Merriman shelter, where she had been staying at, and this is when they informed her that her mother had called and was on her way. Staff and other residents at the shelter said that the news made Emma visibly flustered, and she stormed out of the shelter. One of the staff members tried to run after her but lost sight of her and wasn't sure which way she had gone. Ten minutes later, at 6.10 p.m., a taxi driver picked Emma up near the shelter. She asked him to take her to the airport, but then instantly changed her mind. At this time, it's reported that she had about two to $3,000 in her account, plus that prepaid credit card that she had just purchased that morning. But she told the cab driver that she couldn't afford the $60 cab fare, and she asked to be dropped back off where he had originally picked her up. Once they got her to the drop-off location, she stayed in the cab for a little bit, and the driver said that she was acting extremely strange, And when the dispatch radio came on, she looked panicked, and she asked him, why is there noise coming out of that? She paid for her fare with the debit card and then quickly got out of the cab. At around 6.15 p.m., just right after she had gotten out of that cab, an acquaintance named Dennis Quay saw Emma on the side of the road, and what he claimed to have seen was absolutely jarring. He claimed that Emma was barefoot, despite it being freezing temperatures, and that she looked disoriented, anxious, and confused. He even claimed that she seemed so out of it that she couldn't possibly even cross the street on her own. He allegedly went up to Emma and asked if she was looking for someone or if someone was following her based on her paranoid and anxious behaviors. She wouldn't answer him and was almost ignoring him completely, continuing to look anxious and all around them like she was worried that someone was about to appear. Emma asked him to walk with her for a little bit, which he gladly did, but he couldn't help his burning curiosities, so he kept asking her questions like, what are you doing here? Who are you looking for? Etc. And it was clear that she was getting annoyed with these questions, and she started trying to walk on her own. Unsure of what else to do, Dennis ran into a local restaurant near where they were and he called the police to come and handle the situation and didn't leave until he saw the police there and watching Emma, assuming that at this point whatever was going on wasn't any of his business and now she was in good hands. But that could not have been further from the truth. The two officers who arrived assessed Emma for a total of 45 minutes. According to their notes, she wouldn't even speak to them or tell them her name for 30 minutes. When she finally did speak, it wasn't an open dialogue conversation. She only used one or two words to answer their questions. She refused to put her shoes on or talk to them in great detail, and by 8 p.m., the officers decided that she wasn't a harm to herself or others, 
and they watched her walk away. This was the last time that anyone had ever seen Emma. They asked her um, some fairly pointed questions about her, her well-being. Um, you know, are you feeling depressed or sad? Um, and she said, no, she wasn't. They asked her very specifically, are you feeling suicidal at all? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you feeling not healthy? And she said no. And, and they also asked her about feeling homicidal. Are you feeling like you could do something to somebody else? And she said no. Unfortunately, the identities of the two officers that night are protected by privacy laws, and the details of the conversation have not been released. Shelley filed a Freedom of Information request, but this request was denied without reason. Emma had been lingering around the same areas in town all day long and had witnesses who didn't even know her worried for her and worried for her safety. But the moment she was with law enforcement, just hours before her mother showed up to take her home, they were totally unconcerned, and then she completely vanished. It is by far the worst possible thing imaginable. Um, this is every family's nightmare. This is heartbreaking. Sorry. Not just for me, but for anybody who's going through this. Uh, there's so many people that love Emma. The following days after Emma went missing, Shelley was doing everything she could to try to search for Emma and learn about how she had been acting in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. She thought that if she spoke to everyone who knew her, something of importance might come up that makes more sense or leads them right to her. She sat at the women's shelter all day long talking to each different staff member as the shifts were switching to see how they had betrayed the past few weeks. This was when she found out that Emma had been showing signs for weeks, if not months, and that they had actually called the police two weeks prior, and they did absolutely nothing. Shelley felt as though law enforcement had failed her child before she had even gone missing. I feel like I'm leaving her behind. I thought but it would just be a matter of time. I'd go around a corner and I would see her. One day after Emma had vanished, a witness claimed to have seen someone on the 29th that fit her description at Lifestyle Market on Douglas Street, which was in the area that she had been primarily seen on the 28th, but the sighting was never confirmed. A few days later on December 2nd, a witness told law enforcement about an odd encounter they had near the harbor, which was where Emma also spent a lot of her time during the summer while she was working at Redfish Bluefish. The witness claimed that the young woman looked just like Emma and that she told the stranger, remember the name Ella Philipoff, and then made them repeat her name three times out loud before finally walking away. Three days later, on December 5th, Emma's prepaid credit card was used at a Petro-Canada station. The odd thing, though, was that Emma had not been the one to use it. A man was seen using the card, and police immediately took him in for questioning as well as a polygraph test, which he cleared and passed. He told them that he found the card on the side of the road near the Juan de Fuca Rec Center, which was about a 24-minute drive away from the women's shelter that she had been staying at, so not too far. He called Shelley personally three times after being cleared and told her that he was drinking so heavily at the time that he can't be sure if that's the exact location where he found it, but that he does know that it was still sealed and he waited around a week, give or take, before he used it to purchase a pack of cigarettes. Two years went by and Emma was still nowhere to be found. Missing posters with Emma's face were plastered all over Victoria and surrounding areas. A Facebook page was dedicated to posting photos of people that looked similar to Emma, in an, all in an attempt to find and locate the identities of them to cross out if it really was her or not. A search team of Emma's family, friends, and other volunteers searched all of Victoria and other areas of Vancouver Island. A dive team searched for any evidence of Emma in the harbor where she had allegedly been seen and spent a lot of time in, but nothing was ever found. It's an evidence search. There's nothing to suggest that she's met with foul play, but they're just following any and every lead that they can just to, to keep everything going, and, and they do keep in constant contact with the family. So. A private investigator even worked on the case for a year straight before eventually fading out. Mediums and self-proclaimed psychics even gave their input, claiming that they knew where Emma was and what happened to her. Although Emma's family had never once given up looking for Emma, they did begin to lose hope. Until one random day in 2014, when everything in the case seemed to have changed. In May of 2014, a man was seen on surveillance video walking into a shop in Gastown, B.C., which is about a four-hour drive from Victoria. 
He was clearly very angry, and he was very agitated, holding a missing persons poster. This poster was none other than Emma's. He angrily crumbled up that poster and claimed that Emma was his girlfriend and that she just wanted to be left alone. The footage is pretty grainy, but you can tell the man's general features as well as a distinctive tattoo and limp. Despite all of this, though, the man's identity has never been found. Shelley said that she doesn't believe this man, not even for a second, and even said Emma was very private and independent, but she loved her family, saying, I could see her wanting to go off the grid for a week or two, but not for years. There's no way that she would put her family through this hell. In 2018, six years after Emma had disappeared, a man came forward and shared what he believed might be crucial information to Emma's case. On November 29, 2012, at 5 a.m., which was just hours after Emma had last been seen, he claimed that while he was on his way to work for his first day at a new job, he saw a woman darting back and forth on the side of the road like she was trying to get someone's attention and seemed to be very distressed. He noticed that she was barefoot and soaking wet from head to toe, so he pulled over and let her get into the car. Now remember, it's November, so it's freezing cold. Seeing someone barefoot and wet when it's almost December probably was a very weird sight. He claimed that when she got into his car, she began acting more calm and asked him if he could drive her to Colwood to a girlfriend's house. This was his first day on the job, and he was actually already running late, so he explained that he could drive her a little closer, and then she would have to get out and get the rest of the way there on her own. He drove her for only five minutes before dropping her off at the intersection of Craigflower and Admirals, which was next to a Legion and 24-hour gas station. He said that the very moment that she got out of the car, her calm demeanor shifted, and he could tell that she was acting more anxious and paranoid, like she was looking out for something or someone. He hadn't realized the significance of this interaction until 2018, when he saw something about Emma and her case. Knowing this could be crucial information, he contacted the police, who told him to contact Crime Stoppers about his tip, and never followed up. Once he realized that they were likely never going to call him back, he got in contact directly with Shelley. Thanks to this new information, they were able to search a whole new location that they hadn't been looking in before. But unfortunately, these searches also came up empty. Yeah, she could have. Breaks my heart. All I know is that she was seen at 8 o'clock in front of the Empress Hotel in Victoria. That is the only accurate information I have. That that's is not, it. That's not much to go on 22 it's, months later. It's nothing to go on. It's nothing to call. Police released an age progression photo of what Emma would look like today as a 36-year-old woman. Despite all of the countless tips and sightings that have come in over the years, Emma has still never been found. But her family is still fighting for answers and believes that one day they will know what happened. Okay, show me Emma's if you yeah. would, please. So we can go back up here. It shows different pictures of what Emma would look like, right? And, and that's what people need to see. There are a few main theories as to what happened to Emma. The first is that she fell victim to suicide and that her body has never been found. While she had been displaying many suicidal tendencies in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, many people don't completely believe this theory for a few reasons, the main being that her body has never been found. Other people have found it odd that if she was planning on killing herself, she probably wouldn't have bought a prepaid credit card and cell phone and tried so hard to sell her items for money, if she of course planned on not needing any money. Of course, anything can happen, and sometimes the whole process doesn't make sense to people who aren't experiencing those thoughts, but it just seems a bit unlikely. Her family and friends don't at all believe that this would be something that Emma would ever have done. Really do not believe that Emma took her life. She, there were times that she loved life more than anything, and I just, I don't, I don't believe it, Mark, for a second. Not for a second, no, no. She saw a lot of beauty in the world, and I don't think it's the kind of beauty she'd like to leave. Another theory is that Emma had a complete mental health crisis and decided to start all over. It would make more sense as to why she left behind all of her things and bought a cell phone and a prepaid credit card, even though it was found and used a week later, so she definitely didn't get any use out of it. And her debit card would have set off alarm bells if any money had ever been withdrawn. Maybe the man in 2014 had been telling the truth. 
Now, my mind began working in a bunch of different ways, thinking maybe she had been homeless and started a relationship with this man. Of course, we know she didn't like relationships, or really men in general for that matter, but nothing is impossible. There has also been a lot of speculation online that Emma was possibly displaying symptoms of schizophrenia. I, of course, am not a medical professional, and I am not diagnosing anyone, but it is important to note that since Shelley herself had been worried about her mental health, it's possible. Shelley never mentioned the specific mental illnesses that ran in the family, but people online have been putting things together based on her paranoid state and claiming to have heard objects making noises and speaking to her. Her mother has even said that she worries to this day that she is still out there in a bad mental state possibly, not even knowing who she is, where she is. We've found nothing to indicate that she is in any way in a healthy state of mind, which makes finding her all the more urgent. She has to be somewhere. How could you disappear? Um, so that's what I ask of the public now. Continue being very vigilant and think, 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 think. Even the slightest thing could be a clue. The last theory is that she was experiencing a mental health crisis and became a victim of something more sinister. If someone was out that night looking to get into trouble, what better victim than somebody who already seemed confused and disoriented? Could she have literally fallen into the wrong person's lap? Could she have been kidnapped? And I want to know what you all think because this case kind of has me all over the place. This case is a very important reminder of see something, say something, and that we never know what other people might be going through. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thanks again for tuning in and thank you for being a Patreon and I hope you enjoyed this bonus exclusive episode just for you guys. Let me know what you think in the comments and let's just hope that Emma is found and that her family finally gets some answers. All right guys, thanks and I will be talking with you again very soon. Bye.